Let's follow up afterwards. Okay. Hello, Cassie. Hello. Well, you can hear that. A lot of people seem to very much enjoy your movie. So welcome to London, Ontario. It's great to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Can I see everyone? Yeah, yes. let's, uh, let's, I, I'm, I'm probably going to break something, so you're going to get an upside down view of everyone here. Everyone now uh, wave to Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting creative here. <laughs> so what we've done here is uh, we've shown the movie. A lot of people we know came in. Some people really excited about it. Other people maybe a bit curious about it. What is the reaction generally to the movie versus how you find people are going into it? Uh, well, I, I think most people who have been coming to screenings already knew a little bit of something about men's issues and were curious to see the film for that reason. But from the screenings that I went to, maybe about roughly 10% of people were actually just curious because they hadn't heard anything about the men's rights movement or they were a feminist and curious to, you know, see what the, the film says. And those 10% of people is who I really enjoy having come see the film. And uh, also from my experience going to screenings, a lot of the feminists that have come to the screenings really enjoyed the film and uh, inspired a lot of dialogue afterwards. and didn't see anything in the film that would justify it being banned from certain countries or pulled from theaters, so that was good. And uh, yeah, I think it just really inspires dialogue, and then a lot of people want to see it a second or a third time to take in more uh, from more viewings of the film, because it is a lot to take in for the first time if you've never heard about these issues before. When you were making the film, there's obviously a bit of a division that a filmmaker often has from their subject, but in your case, you went on the other side of the camera, you became the subject. Was that always supposed to happen, or was that something that occurred during the development? Yeah, I, well, so for anyone who doesn't know the backstory of how I came to make this film, or why I chose to make this film, when I initially stumbled across the men's rights movement in 2013, I had already been a feminist of about 10 years, and my previous films were about women's issues, or LGBT issues, and I was fascinated that there was a men's rights movement. I'd never heard of it before, but when I started looking into them from what the mainstream media was telling me, it, it sounded a little like they were misogynistic hate group, and so it make for good TV. If this is a hate group that's never been shown in a film before, then I will be the first, and let's you know expose these guys, essentially. So that's why I, I started making the film. But obviously, as you all have seen now, the, the film didn't turn into what I thought it was going to make because when I was interviewing men's rights activists and feminists and also contemplating my own views on these issues, I realized it was a lot more nuanced and complex than the way the mainstream media portrays the men's rights movement. So, uh, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, I, I really believe that this is a powerful medium to tell true life stories to viewers around the world that otherwise would never meet these people or, or hear about these different uh, issues and, and from different perspectives. So as a documentary filmmaker, I was you know, faced with the, the challenge of, okay, do I make the film that's the true story, but is not considered marketable and is gonna have so many roadblocks to get this film released and out in theaters, as you can tell, and released on mainstream platforms. Uh, and so, of course, I chose to, you know, show the real journey I went on and hope that there would be someone out there that would want to see this film and, and support it. And the Kickstarter campaign I did to fund this film was definitely proof that there were people that wanted to see this film made and wanted to, you know, help get it out there despite the obstacles. Uh, one of the questions here that I find to be an interesting one, could you touch on the social implications, this feeling of injustice, this feeling of... You know, men feel like they're the victims, women feel like they're the victims. Uh, when you look at the legal side of that, so issues with parents' rights, custody battles, how much of the men's rights activism is focused on the legal side versus the social? Mm, good question. Um, well, I would say a lot of the men's rights activists I spoke to were focused on the legal uh, the issues and policies that they wanted to see changed. and. 
I think the reason why I didn't so much go into the specifics of, of those policies and, and the legal issues in the film is because I didn't want to put a time stick in on this. And for instance, one example is in the US, we have selective service still around where every boy that's 18 to 25 years old has to sign up for the selective service in the case that there's a draft uh, during war that he could be called upon to go into active duty. And uh, and while I was completing the film in the editing process, we just started talking about should this be uh, overturned or include women in the draft. And so I, I made a conscious decision to not include that particular issue that much in the film because I, I think, I still think, it may change soon and I don't want to, you know, uh, I won't want this <laughs> in Alvin as it is today because I'm hoping, you know, gender equality will start including the other half of the equation and we can talk about men's issues without it being called hate speech. There was one of the video uh, diaries. But yeah, I, sorry, to answer your question. There was one of the video diaries <laughs> where you're in the kitchen, and yeah, I do apologize because of the, uh, unfortunately, the magic of TV sometimes comes with a leg, but uh, everyone here seems very patient. When you are in the kitchen in one of your video diaries, and you can start to see for the first time in that film that really massive uh, conflict, that really massive conflict where you're going on one hand, on the other hand, on one hand, on the other hand, and I'm curious if the change for you was a gradual one, or if there was one turning point where, like some light bulb, you all of a sudden started to change the way that you saw the world. Oh, it, it was a really long process. The lot out of little like, red hill moments. If you put it. Uh, one of my initial red hill moments was about three months into filming, was learning about how infant male circumcision and was really a race for in terms of you know gender equality before. And then another kind of red pill moment I had was learning about domestic violence shelters and the lack of shelters for men. And my own bias was that I thought we needed more women's shelters because if men are usually the breadwinner of the household, they could either go get a hotel or have some kind of financial means to get away from his abusive girlfriend or wife, whereas women need these shelters if they don't have financial independence. And uh, then, you know, realizing how that doesn't, uh, you know, fit every situation. And, and also this is largely government funded shelters in the U.S. And so, uh, and also you could argue that men actually pay more taxes because they earn more money overall in the U.S. And so, you know, these, these shelters are funded mostly by, by men's taxpayer dollars and, and they're only, you know, services for women. So, so the diaries were really, uh, when I started to, I, I was learning about men's issues and I still had a lot of walls up about really thinking these were issues and I always wanted to make it, bring it back to women saying that women had it worse, but watching my diaries back and realizing how, uh, how unwilling I was to have compassion for these issues for men and boys, uh, that's what really started to kind of chip away at my hard feminist shell and, and realize that I, was, I, I wasn't being uh, inclusive in my own pursuit of gender equality. A couple of people are handing me questions here asking about reaction to some of the feminist voices or from some of the feminist voices you interviewed in the film. So specifically Big Red, also the woman who was from the magazine, Ms. Magazine. Uh, what has the response been from those people since the film? Oh, I, well, at this, because they would have had to go gone to a screening to see the film. So the only feminist in the film that I know has seen the film is Michael Kimmel because he was at the New York premiere of the film back in October, and uh, he participated in the Q and A, and you can actually see that on YouTube if you want to Google that and watch that. Uh, but I thought he had a pretty positive reaction to the film in that he said, "There's nothing in the film that isn't a part of." the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, that all people should be treated equally under the law regardless of their gender. And so in that way, I think he kind of, you know, gave his indirect 
approval of the film, saying that, yeah, this is just talking about gender equality. Uh, but, you know, obviously feminists and men's rights activists have, are looking at gender equality issues from different perspectives and looking at, uh, see different issues that are part of the problem leading to these inequalities. And so, um, but Michael Kimmel, you know, he at least came to the screening and participated in the Q&A. And I, I don't know if Big Red has seen the film yet. I don't think she has. I don't think Catherine Spiller from Men's Magazine has yet. Uh, we did have, I'm going to kind of go off topic of this, this question for a second, but we did have a women's film festival uh, that's in the same general area as Men's Magazine that invited me to screen the film and also participate on the panel. They were going to host me flying down and, and being a part of that. And, um, and then they shared it with their board members and the board members decided to pull the film from the film festival. So I, I don't know if Ms. Maxine was a part of that. Um, I, I think they may have been a part of it, so I, I don't know, but um, yeah. One, <laughs> one other aside, you mentioned Dr. Kimmel, and, and he gave a, a very, again, a very smart guy, but he gave one answer in your interview with him where he had talked about the fact that if this inequality were real, men's rights activists would want to bring men's issues up and work with women rather than wanting to bring awareness of women's issues down. Would you say that's an accurate characterization of the men's rights activists you did meet with, where they don't just want to bring their own issues up to equal footing, but they actually do want to replace discussion of women's issues with men's issues instead? I, well, the men's rights activists I interviewed definitely didn't want to say it, it, Men's rights activists didn't say women don't have issues, and they definitely didn't say defund programs for women. Uh, so when Michael Kimmel says that, well, why are they trying to take away funds from women's shelters or, or helping female victims, I have never came across that in the 44 people that I interviewed for this film. And, uh, you know, and the people that I interviewed that were on the men's rights activist side of the spectrum, they are considered the leaders and the, the influencers of the men's rights movement. So if there are any men's rights activists online that say something otherwise that, that is saying women don't have issues or, or that, they, that funding shouldn't support women's programs, then usually those commenters are anonymous and are kind of, you know, hidden from their, whoever they are. Uh, and who knows if I, I've heard that also people can plant comments to make it look like it's from one side to then be able to quote it in an article and say, look at what they say, but it was actually just, you know, someone acting like that that uh, person to make them look bad. So, uh, but yeah, so all I can go off of is what I, you know, people I interviewed and who they are and what they say. I didn't find that from Paul Elam or Warren Farrell or Dean Esmay. Were there any interviews or any segments or any clips that you really wanted to get in but you couldn't for reasons of flow or time constraints, but stuff that was on the cutting room floor that would be of note? Oh gosh, so much. I, I have over a hundred hours of footage and the film is only two hours long, so there's a lot that hit the cutting room floor. Um, uh, gosh, well one thing that just comes to mind right now is that, that time that I'm doing the video diary where I guess I'm crying at the moment when I'm crying and I'm saying the truth is somewhere in the middle and I don't know where the truth is. What I say right after that is I say I don't know what the red pill is and, I, and then I start to try to conceptualize well what are MRA saying the red pill is and what do I really think the red pill is because you know, the red pill reference comes from the matrix and it just means see, seeing the difficult hard truth. And um, so I, I'm a little uh, regretful that I didn't include that because I I've been attacked a lot over the title of the film, The Red and Being the Red Pill, and part of the reason for the title is because it was a way for me to compartmentalize the feminist perspective versus the men's rights perspective, and so the men's rights being the red pill perspective and the feminist perspective being the blue pill. And so in a lot of my di diaries, I go back and forth between the red pill and blue pill. Um, so maybe one day I'll release some of the raw diaries and people can see, you know, even more why it's called red pill. Uh, but topics, I, I really wish I could have included the gender wage gap because that was a huge light bulb moment for me while I was filming was uh, digging deeper into that and and um, kind of actually going through this like mourning period of wondering why I was 
has the mainstream media have been, you know, kind of outright lying about, you know, women make 77 cents to a man's dollar and making it sound like it's purely gender discrimination when it's so many other factors. And um, and when you hear that as a young girl, you actually start to internalize that, like there's something wrong with you that, that you're less than human or you're less than because you're being paid less than. And, and I think learning the truth of those studies that show that men earn more than women earn as a whole uh, is actually a lot more empowering as a woman to know that you have the power within your capability to earn more if you choose to make these sacrifices in, in your life and how you, you know, approach work versus, uh, you know, other fulfilling aspects of your life. So. You spoke early on in the movie about your own background as an actress and being pigeonholed in a certain way. And obviously this movie has been very controversial. You talked earlier about band in a certain country. Have you now been pigeonholed as this person? And has that had a negative re or negative implication on your own ability to work in the field that uh, you're clearly quite good in? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know yet. I haven't started a new project, so I don't know if I am going to be um, to deny certain jobs because of now the stigma of having made this film. Uh, right before I was making the Red Pill, I, I was directing some really uh, impressive commercials that was my bread and butter, that's how I paid my bills. And uh, and I, I was also kind of known as the director that worked really well with women's stories and children, uh, like child actors and um, or documentary type commercials, like one of the big documentary commercials that I directed was for Xfinity Comcast and it was about a seven-year-old blind girl and I did a series of documentaries for them and um, you know just the ability to relate to women's stories and children's stories uh, so I, I hope I don't you know lose those kind of job opportunities because of now having made this film and, and I still am very passionate about women's issues absolutely uh, so it, it will be interesting and maybe some of you out there know that the film is finally going to be released worldwide next week on March 7th and so up until now it's only just been these kind of grassroots screenings how people have seen the film and so I'm really curious when people have the ability to see it, see it in the privacy of their own home and uh, you know I think there are a lot of people that are curious to see this film but they don't actually want to go to a movie theater to see it or be out in public seeing this film so um, we'll, we'll see how it affects <laughs> in my future career. One of your video diaries as well, you're talking about the fact that, you know, men's rights activists have their arms crossed and get really in a huff when women talk about the plight of women. And, and then you said on the other side, you know, you as a feminist were wondering, okay, well, arms crossed, you know, what, what are these people talking about? Is there a right side and a wrong side that you have at the end of this film, or is it about getting both sides to uncross their arms and realize that, hey, maybe both grievances or both sets of grievances have merit? Hmm, I like that, getting both sides to uncross their arms. I, I think that, uh, you know, that visual and, and what that kind of body language means is, is actually really important for us to identify because it, it, it is being closed off to hearing something that you don't necessarily want to hear. And, um, and it is amazing how, how much we do live in echo chambers, especially online, where we're only uh, getting information from sources that, I guess, online algorithms <laughs> think that we, we want to get. And, uh, and something about coming from a feminist mindset, looking at the men's rights movement, I, it, when I came to, to starting to make this film and, and interviewing men's rights activists, I, I really, uh, I don't know if the right way to say this, so I'm just going to use a word that I think is the wrong word. I was really otherizing them, that it was just this other, that I, I, I didn't even think that they would be a part of my inner circle of family or friends, so it was just really easy to dismiss them and not really want to listen to what they had to say or their perspectives. But once I, I was you know, forced to sit down for hours on end and just listen to them without responding because for uh, being a documentary filmmaker, you, you can't always talk over them or try to make a, a rebuttal because you need them to let out their entire answer. Uh, so being able to you know, just sit, be silent, and listen to them and then also watch the footage back for the editing process, I, it took a long time, it took many years, and I don't know if other people will be able to have the same kind of 
life-changing experience that I had because I did it over three and a half years. But um, but I just really started to understand their perspective and where they're coming from. And it's not as simple as saying women haters or misogynists or uh, wanting to turn that back the clock on women's rights. It um, it's so much more complicated and and uh, and it takes going past the clickbait headline to really <laughs> get to the bottom of what a, a lot of points that people want to make are. Um, you said in the movie Dr. Farrell still remained a member of the National Organization for Women now, and there was another woman that came to mind when I saw that, Karen DeCrow, who used to be the president of NOW, and she never disavowed feminism, she never disavowed now, but she was starting to adopt before men's rights activism was a thing, a lot of these men's rights cases as an attorney, you know, paternity rights and other things like that. Did you encounter in your research, in your filming, a lot of people who had approached men's rights activism from feminism? Mm. I, you know, there are a lot of uh, feminists that do uh, want to talk about men's issues and bring them to the forefront. Obviously, Christina Hoff Summers is, is one of them, and Camille Paglia. And I haven't met them or talked to them or even reached out to them yet. Uh, I definitely do want to meet them, uh, maybe for a future film. Uh, but the reason was because with the red pill, I really wanted to look at the polar opposite spectrums. And Christina Hoff Summers is this kind of you know strange enigma where she still is holding on to feminism, but really does talk about men's issues. And and she has this YouTube called The Factual Feminist, where she dispels a lot of the um, the myths that feminists put out there. And uh, so I, I didn't interview her for the red pill, but but I during my screenings with the red pill, I have had a lot of feminists ask me, can we be a men's rights activist and a fem feminist? Can we be both? And then other people would say, well, you should just call yourself egalitarian or atheist. And, and I think labels in general are problematic in themselves. And that's why right now I, I still am holding on to the, the idea that I'm going to be labelless as long, as long as I can, as long as people allow me to be that. I'm sure other people will try to label me for me, but I'm not labeling myself anything right now. And um, the reason for that is because I, I did uh, start calling myself a feminist when I was around 18 or 19, and you know, it was before I really got the whole scope of, of what that meant and um, all the implications of that. And, and so I don't want to just adopt a new label without really knowing everything about what that means. And, and also having a label kind of puts you on one side of the court where now anyone that you talk to is, okay, you're an egalitarian, well, you're an equalist. Are we going to have a fight now because they're different labels? But, you know, I, I think, you know, those are kind of similar. Um, probably people who are equalist or egalitarian line up mostly along the same issues. But, uh, but yeah, I, I would like to see, you know, just have a room full of 20 people and no one can tell their label if they're feminist, men's rights activist, egalitarian, equalist, whatever, and just talk about one issue after the other and, and really explore every aspect of it and see if we can come to solutions without labels involved. Just in closing here, someone asks, uh, as a feminist, how can we ensure men get those equal rights? I mean, what do you, and I realize this is a lofty question, but what does that equality, that ultimate gender sex equality look like? Uh, I, I think something we all really need to ask ourselves is what would equality look like and, and do we want that? Because I know there are uh, a lot of ways that I do like my, uh, my feminine side of myself and, and I, I wouldn't want to be in an entirely androgynous culture and uh, but I also I a huge supporter of the LGBT community and I, my last film before the red pill was about gay marriage and and something that was really interesting about making that film was all the, the gay couples that I looked at that were married had very specific gender roles. There would be a breadwinner and there would be a stay at home father and the caregiver and uh, homemaker and and I mean as far as my close knit group of a uh, circle of friends, uh, I guess about six different couples, gay couples that I know that are married, they all have very defined gender roles. And so when we look at gender inequality or gender discrimination, I think we should really phrase it more as the pros and cons of the gender role. 
because you know a lot of the things that women experience um, for being that we think just for being a woman, there are gay guys in a, in a gay relationship that also experience that. Like uh, my friend who's a stay-at-home gay father, and and he has uh, difficulty going back in, into the workforce after having stayed home for ten years raising the kids and lost all that you know ten years of job experience and. Uh, so I think we should, you know, look at the pros and cons, the, the advantages and disadvantages of the role, rather than say it's simply gender discrimination. Cassie J, filmmaker of the Red Bull. Thank you so much for joining us. Really great to talk to you. Um, 
and we would like to petition City Council to recognize it officially. <laughs> We'll also be hosting some kind of event to help raise awareness. That is still in the planning stages because we have been totally swamped with the work preparing this event. But that means that if you guys have any ideas or if you want to take part in any way, just contact us and we can make it happen. And that's really all I have to say. Um, thank you guys for coming out. I've had a wonderful time. I hope you have too. And uh, I really hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.